Hmm. Hi, everyone. You all know me as Sappho, and I wanted to make a video about coming out. Coming out with anything can be very difficult, especially if it's something that society currently views with disgust or is a bit dangerous to even come out with with the way that things are right now. And it's a lot like when homosexuals were coming out in the 1960s during Stonewall and those sorts of events. And I know that 99% of my viewers, my community, you don't have anything wrong with homosexuals or gay people. You support them, you support LGBT, nothing against them. But I guarantee that many of you, even if you can't imagine it now, if you were growing up in the 1960s and were being fed all of the news and social propaganda about how gay people should stay in the closet, how it's unnatural and against nature and all sorts of crazy shit like that, a lot of you would probably be anti-gay, anti-LGBT. And that's just how it is. And I respect you all. And frankly, this sort of thing would have leaked out eventually especially with how cancel culture is these days and other furry drama. There would be people out there that, you know, they want to have a, a gotcha moment. They want to build their fame and popularity and, you know, expose people. And <laughs> I, I'm just not going to give the opportunity for a Sappho exposed kind of video. And I would rather suck the air out of the sails of the Ransonas and instead of letting this sort of thing build, just be open and honest ab about myself and my beliefs. And I want to clear the air and say that for the record, I am a zoophile. You did not mishear that. I am a zoophile. I do not have a thing for humans. I am more attracted to dogs like German Shepherds. If you are willing to stay and listen to my view and explanation, that is the point of this video. It is to show that there are ethical guidelines. It's not so black and white like many furries think that it is and a full explanation as to the way that I think and the way that others think and why. Zoophilia is often very misunderstood, especially because of certain very terrible people and what you may have seen in the news. And someone that I will not mention, if you remember that situation with the zoo sadism leaks, a few years back. Unfortunately, when people think of zoophiles, especially furries, that's the person that comes to mind. That is the situation that comes to mind. And I'm talking about horrible abuses. And I'm not accusing a certain individual of anything here, but those leaks showed some truly horrendous people doing awful things to puppies, dead animals, animal gore, and other atrocities that I really wish would have been prosecuted, but unfortunately most could not, either by legal technicalities or so on. And it's a really sore thing for me because I would have liked to have seen justice 
in that case, I really would have liked to see that justice. But just because somebody was not charged or prosecuted does not mean that they were not guilty of what those videos showed and what those logs showed. And I will leave it at that. I couldn't imagine somebody doing that sort of shit to my animals, my mate, my... <sighs> Just, I can't imagine who would harm another living being in those ways. And to be 100% clear, I am not like that. Most of the zoo community is also not like that and utterly despises it. People who force animals into situations they don't want, physically and through other means, are completely deplorable and seen as rapists. Playing with an animal that is not sexually mature is like the equivalent of pedophilia, and it's treated as such. I do not support those people, and they do not deserve the same title. They're fetishists and bestialists. I do not want them to be the face of the community, and they should not be the face of the community. It's like literal Nazis considering themselves furries in the fandom. You don't want them. We don't want them. We don't want that image. To be what people think about. Ethical zoos are not like that. Zoophiles are among the most caring and loving people towards animals and their mates. We see animals as equals to humans, not as property or an object like in the eyes of the law and others. Specifically, I and other ethical zoos follow what's called Zeta Principles. Zeta being the Greek symbol, but also standing for zoophiles engagement for tolerance and acceptance. So if you see that symbol on a furry, that's probably what they're referring to, or they're an ally towards that kind of cause. And those principles are bestow upon animals the same kindness one would wish bestowed upon oneself, consider the well-being of an animal companion as important as one's own, place the animal's will and well-being ahead of one's desires for sexual gratification, teach those who seek knowledge about zoophilia and bestiality without promoting it, discourage the practice of bestiality in the presence of fetish seekers, censor sexual exploitation of animals for the purpose of financial gain, and censor those who practice and promote animal sexual abuse. Zoophiles are not the same as bestialists and fetishists who do not follow those principles. Hypothetically speaking, I would see my partner or my mate as an equal to myself. Everything would be out of love, care, and affection for their wellness and well-being. It would not be to serve myself and my desires. And a lot of people have issues with the sort of thing which is understandable. I, I can I can understand the the point of view that others have about my views. Uh, the biggest argument of course that comes up is about consent and what is that like, right? And they want to compare a like apples to oranges they want to compare a grown adult sexually mature animal to like a toddler basically comparing apples to oranges and in my opinion it's a bad faith argument 
I don't think you can compare a sexually mature animal to a not sexually mature human. I think it's bad faith. But back to that hypothetical, and my view on it is that if my mate came up to me, loved me, and wanted something more in that moment, why would I deny them that need? I want to care for their well-being and help them feel good. At the same time, if the animal is uncomfortable or walks away, that's a no. That's a do not continue. That's a I do not consent. I have a really close zoo friend that can explain more in a non-hypothetical way in the second half of this video. And this friend has a female German Shepherd mate and considers her to be the love of his life. And why am I like this? Well, we can speculate on that. I have always loved animals in this kind of way. Even back when I was 11, uh, that would probably be the earliest that I remember, I always found comfort and love in animals. I would lie down with them for hours, sleep cuddled up with them, and never treat myself as any better. My two golden retrievers at the time were my place of safety and comfort. And no, I did not do anything sexual with them. It was something that later on I had always thought about, but I was so ashamed for so long about being the way that I am. It caused a lot of mental pain and turmoil. And yes, but recently after discovering there's other people with similar feelings to me and ideals, it has inspired me enough to have this message. And that would include online resources like the Zooier Than Thou podcast and some other people that I've met through some internet forums. And really what I want to do is to educate people about what it means specifically to be a zoophile and that there are shades of gray, not this black and white evil nonsense comparing someone like me to a freak that forces themselves onto animals and commits horrendous animal abuse. This is to have a personal conversation with my community, furries, zoophiles, and others, and I am more than happy to answer questions or be interviewed in a neutral manner. With that out of the way, I'm going to switch to more of a podcast style video. I'm just gonna start recording and cool. <laughs> so it's really good to have you here. It's good to be talking again. And it's my honor to be your guest. Awesome. Cool. So this isn't going to be like a super formal thing, just more of a casual conversation for the people that might be curious watching the video. Um, uh, people that might be a little more curious about seeing who somebody who uh, is zoo exclusive. Um, someone who themselves is a zoophile and practices it, uh, where I would consider myself a zoophile, but, you know, at the moment, that's not really something that I'm doing. So just for the record, we are both zoophiles. And um, you're my closest zoo friend and really helped me accept myself. And in fact, you made a post on Zooville, um, and in that particular post, it was about you coming out about things, and you linked uh, an episode of the Zooier Than Thou podcast about coming out. 
And that just really inspired me to make this video and to like go forward with being more open about it. So any comment on that? Oh, I'm just really glad to hear that. And it's, it's always a risk putting yourself out there and telling your story. And my hope has been to help others find acceptance so that they don't blunder through the seemingly endless darkness of denial and repression that so many of us have experienced. And it just makes me sad that some people will never see the end of that. And uh, I'm overwhelmed with joy in your case that you, I was able to directly help you in that way. Absolutely. And uh, I, <clears throat> yeah, it's exceeded my, exceeded my hopes for making that particular post. Absolutely. I went through a whole lot of mental pains, really just refusing to accept who I was for the longest time. And I mean, I would go through some hard periods going through my teens where I would be really into it and know and accept myself like, yes, I am a zoophile, but there weren't those kinds of resources that really talked about it in an open way and um, really broke that perception that the mainstream has about zoophilia. So every time that I would kind of come around to it, I would feel so ashamed and alone that I would just lock all of that in and really just curl up into a ball, really. And I know that you kind of went through a similar experience um, coming out and you also had a struggle to come to accepting yourself. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, I certainly relate to wanting to curl into a ball and just hide away from all the ugliness that the internet, you know, that comes up on the internet when you search for any sort of these things. And uh, that's definitely been a big struggle of mine, having those feelings and those thoughts over the course of my whole life and not having any person I felt like I could talk to about or would even beyond just understand and accept, but be able to actually relate to and uh, I struggled to find myself for many years and struggled with my identity as a result of that. And it sort of all fell into place when I just removed myself from society. I turned off my phone. I went and hiked up a mountain. And I just wrote it all out and admitted it all to myself first. And I looked at it, my whole history with these feelings and these thoughts, and I just said, okay. I accept this. And that was when my world changed. Uh, my mate came along not too long after that. And I found this community and found the Zero Year the Now podcast. And it's, I'm not going to say that everything is perfect, that I feel 100% okay. It's still, a, it's still a daily work in progress, but it's so much easier to just be at a point where I'm okay. Absolutely. And I can look myself in the mirror and and say it. You know, I'm a zoo. And mm -hmm. my partner is the love of my life. And, you know, we're, I love her romantically, physically. You know, that's, that is okay. And I think so, too. And, you know, it's it's really amazing to hear how you overcame that struggle and came to that realization and came to accept yourself for who you are. And would you say that you've had to make some sacrifices along the way? Certainly. Um, sacrifice, that might be a bit of a strong word, at least so far. There's been awkward, awkward moments where, you know, like uh, my mom in particular, as any good parent does just wants to see their kid find someone be happy and you know she set me up with someone to go on a date with and you know i liked her but i didn't but i had these mixed feelings and i wanted to be polite but i didn't it, you know it was just 
it was really awkward. And so that's what led me to finally come out and say, look, I have someone and I'm happy. Yes, she has four legs, but just to hopefully avoid those kinds of things in the future where, you know, someone else's feelings might be at stake. Yeah. And to really curb those perceptions, um, you see your mate as like the love of your life. Yeah. And what do you both do together for like fun and play and, and like, what, what's that like? How, how does that work? Well, I basically spending time with her is my number one priority. And it's, I wish I could, if I could, I would just spend a hundred percent of my time with her. I'd never work because <laughs> it's just so much fun. And so I take, pleasure in simple things you know a walk in the woods I could do that all day I love it and she enjoys those things as well and just I try to spend at least a couple hours just being active outdoors with her every day and I just take pleasure in watching her enjoy herself even with it's if it's with another person or with another dog or with me or by herself um so that's a bit of a snapshot of our daily routine. I'm fortunate to live in an area where um, exercising her is possible. Mm -hmm. And I've put myself in a position where I could give her what I imagine to be the best possible life for her that I could provide. And 100% just clarifying for people, the vast majority of the time that you spend with your mate it's not like sexual or sexualized. It's just being like a good couple doing normal things. Absolutely. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, and and it's it's too early in her life to do those sorts of things really in to that full extent yet. So, you know, yeah. and that's another part of being being zoo exclusive is it's an individual adventure it's not like we have all these role models around us say this is what's right this is what's wrong it's mm -hmm. there is obviously you can tell consent yes or no if you can read basic body language but right. it's still an individual adventure and you get to know your partner and you get to know yourself and i'm still learning a lot that's very true and yeah, it, so kind of going off on that leg about, you know, you can tell when they're consensual and such, uh, a lot of people struggle with that because, you know, they they don't understand how dogs mature and how zoophiles don't go after, like, puppies and small dogs and stuff. They They just want to perceive us as, like, evil people who you know if we get close to Rapist. their dog yeah it's like when we see your dog walking down the street we're not thinking oh wow i want to tap that like that's not how it is and <laughs> well we can't speak for all of us <laughs> well i can't speak for all zoophiles yeah but but i know for me it's it's definitely like that and it's you know if you're going to be with a dog that is not sexually mature, which is at least like a year and a half, two years old for a lot of breeds, it's like a lot of us consider that like pedophilia in a way. Um, if you're doing like intercourse and such, that's, that's just how it is. So I, I really want to clarify that for the people watching this video that you know, there are ethical guidelines that people follow. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it is primarily about having that emotional bond and that's what I've learned through having uh, at least one really meaningful, non-sexual romantic attraction to another dog who's belonged to a friend of mine. And that's what really taught me who I am, I would say was yeah. that I could find that love and that 
bond without the physical aspect of sex. And another thing to know, um, also going along with that kind of romantic but not sexual relationship that you had with your friend's dog, um, just want to clarify and really uh, help people understand that this isn't about one's personal desires for you know, sexual gratification or anything like that, but it's pretty much purely about caring about the well-being of your mate, of the animals that you love, and it's not about controlling them or forcing them to do sexual acts. Right. It's the beauty. A true zoo will know it's the beauty of that mutual bond that you find with one another when you're able to communicate on a two-way street. Exactly. And and there's going to be a whole bunch of resources in the description for people who are interested and really want to dig in and kind of understand this stuff. But uh even like professional dog trainers, um, they'll masturbate their dogs during training because it helps is that them right? With, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it is because it helps them with stress release and feeling better, and it's used as a training tool. Uh, and and what's amazing is that you know with with this consensual stuff with a sexually mature animal. People will be all up in arms about that, but they're not against uh, these, like, uh, breeding, I don't know what you'd call them. They're, um, like, facilities where they breed dogs, basically, where they forcefully take semen out of one dog and then forcefully inject it into another, and it's like, how is that okay? Yeah. And it's it's because people view animals as property. They're not viewing them as another living being that deserves the same rights. And that's that's what really gets me uh, about this this whole thing. So right, yeah. and that's a huge that's a huge debate in and of itself. That what you, what artificial insemination and what you mentioned and. Yeah, we we could jump down any number of rabbit holes. For sure. And now you had that post about coming out. Do you, you want to mention exactly how you came out or who you came out to? Yes. So I take it coming out is like anything where you have to convey an idea and do it in a thoughtful way that's respectful to, in my case, me and my partner, but also my audience, who in this case was my mom. And I thought a lot about terminology I could use and, you know, potentially getting asked questions and uh, how I was going to handle that. And essentially, I only said I used the word attraction i didn't use the word mm. sex or anything like that <clears throat> i just said i'm attracted to in this case i said other species i left it very wide open mm -hmm. and the, i she didn't my mom's awesome she didn't pry me say oh you know are you screwing your dog are you screwing my horses blah 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 you know she was just like okay you know thank you for telling me um you know that's i'm glad that you found someone who you're happy with and I'm glad this worked out. And that's, you know, that's all I wanted for you is to just to find someone and be happy. But then she also said, you know, I'm worried about the fact that your partner isn't going to live as long as you and, you know, mm -hmm. seeing you fall apart when she's gone. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a large part of the pain of this orientation is that many species don't live, but a, a fifth of our lives. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, you know, I, and I've come out to a couple of my friends, at least I want to say at least five other people, and I've never once had a bad experience with that. And that's not to say it's 100% safe. 
you got to know your audience and you got to choose your words wisely. Absolutely. And what's great is that now we have these resources like the Zooier the Now podcast that people can watch and really understand these kinds of nuances about what it means to be a zoophile and how you know it's it's not about the fetishists and the the people that are bestialists you know where the, those sorts of things are very antithetical to how we think about our orientation and what gets me too is that you know people treating animals as property and objects like like they're stuffed toys basically and it's like i i would say that addressing their sexual needs uh helps them relax lowers their aggression and overall helps them feel better and and i'm not saying somebody putting themselves onto the animal because 99% of the time, the animal is the one that's initiating that kind of contact. Like, it, you know, a lot of people might be familiar with like a dog humping their leg, for instance. Um, that dog sees you as a member of the pack or the herd, and that's how they see things. And they're the one that's kind of initiating the action and overall, it helps them with their wellness and their well-being. So I just wanted to make a quick note of that. It's part of something that I'm reading from the resources section. Right. Yeah, and it is, it's excellent to have all these resources available nowadays. And I'd encourage anyone who's considering coming out to be um, prepared to answer questions help people understand yeah but you know also, and, and yeah cite well, examples like this is super helpful yeah and and we're not promoting it we're not trying to force people to be a part of it or anything like that we're just explaining our orientation and what it means really to be a zoophile and I think that's what's really beautiful about this conversation that we're having. Yeah, I'm honored once again to be here and be able to talk about these things openly. I never thought never thought I'd see the day where I could feel comfortable doing this. <laughs> and I hope it helps others of you I, out there, be so it, whether you have the same sorts of feelings as us or you're just trying to learn more. Yeah, and, about and who I we hope, are. I hope that we have more of a positive kind of response to this video. I know that there's going to be quite a quite a shitstorm, uh, probably caused by me publishing this sort of thing very publicly. But I do hope that people will understand. Um, and maybe they're more neutral, they they don't want to burn me on a stake, but they also maybe don't fully accept kind of my views. Um, yeah, and, that, and that's, that's totally fine. Um, when it comes to the laws and legal and all of that, I, I really think that people should consider whether or not the animal enjoyed the interaction, not just, you know, the black and white of deciding for that animal that it didn't enjoy it de facto because I said so and that sort of thing. Like, that's, that's kind of my view on that and that we can't necessarily judge people's morals just from one single thing that they're into or one aspect of themselves, you know. Um, and that's why this might be hard for a lot of people because they're going to see, you know, they know me. 
they know I'm affectionate and loving and really help people. And then they see, oh, they're also a zoophile. (laughs) And I really hope (laughs) that people don't completely judge my morality off of that single aspect of myself. And I hope they don't judge you either. I hope so too, but like you, I'm prepared for it. Absolutely. It's an eventuality that we've uh, incurred potentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, risks must be taken, I believe, in order to help others. And I'm glad I took the risk that resulted in helping you out uh, get to where you are here today. Thank you. And I, I wouldn't take it back for any negative comment. <laughs> well, it was good having you here, and um, I'm sure that this has answered a lot of people's questions, gave a little bit more insight on the conversation, and maybe uh, fulfilled those cravings for some people for more information about somebody who actually practices zoophilia and has a mate. So, yeah. Yeah, Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Sounds good.